Coming up, I check out Amiga versions of Spectrum games on my A500 Mini. I play some games, I look at some newer titles, and Jeff reads a book. Let's get on then. The Spectrum had some classic and iconic games for it. Games that made you say wow, games that made you feel you're in an arcade, games that defined genres and games that were unique. When newer computers came along, some of those games were ported across, not all with great success. The A500 Mini was released in April 2022, and I got mine on the 9th, and pretty excited I was about it too. I loved my Amiga back in the day. It was a truly revolutionary machine, in similar ways to the Spectrum, and it looked superb. The non-working keyboard and case are all familiar to anyone who owned one. Inside, the hardware is capable of emulating a variety of models and chipsets, so this can play A1200 games as well. I wanted to take a look at some of the games that were ported or rewritten from the original Spectrum versions. Some came way after the original release on the Spectrum, and some were developed around the same time as each other. So let's kick off then with an old favourite, Manic Miner. Released on the Spectrum in 1983, the Amiga version was released in 1990. An iconic game for the Spectrum that really needs no introduction. The Amiga release gave us two versions. The original, which is, well, mm, a bit of a rewrite using Spectrum style graphics really. The music soon gets annoying and the control feels a little odd, and on the A500 the minor Willis sprite wouldn't display on the bottom level. It's playable though, but the original is far better. Go. Then you get the Amiga version of the game. Here the screen scrolls, as the full playing area has been enlarged. Minor Willy looks, well, not right really. There is something about it that doesn't work for me. The graphics have been updated, as you would expect, and the levels are all there if you can get to them. I can't help feel this is a cash-in on the name, and there are much better platform games on the Amiga. It was interesting to play this after so many years. I remember waiting for it to arrive in the computer shop that I worked at, only to be disappointed when I loaded it. On to Count Ducula then, this was released on the Spectrum in 1989 and on the Amiga in 1990. The Spectrum version has monochrome graphics and some really nice sprites. The gameplay is easy enough, but what about the Amiga version? Well, as you would expect by now, much improved graphics and sound, and it retains the gameplay. The animation of the main character is a little bit too fast, I think, and a bit awkward, but the backgrounds work really well. There is a choice of having music or effects while playing, and it's easy to play with the A500 controller. A simple game of collect and use, more aimed at the younger generation I think. On to another Spectrum classic then, Chucky Egg released on the Sinclair machine in 1983 and on the Amiga in 1988. Another iconic Spectrum game, a great variation of the genre with a lot of extra mechanics and fast action. The Amiga version retains the screen layout and adds a background, which can sometimes make things difficult to see. There could have been so much more done to this to make it really shine, the platforms are only single colour, and the ladders are the same colour as well. The sprites could have been improved, and sadly, Henhouse Harry has been turned into an egg. Control is tricky with the gamepad, especially getting onto ladders, but overall, the gameplay is still there.
Next is Exelon, released on the Spectrum in 1987 and on the Amiga in 1989. Exelon on the Spectrum was a brilliant game. It had large, well-animated and drawn sprites, it had colourful landscapes, great sound and excellent gameplay. So how would the Amiga version compare? But when we get into the game, I feel it doesn't do the original justice. The graphics are somehow less vibrant, they look dark with less colour variation. The main sprite doesn't look like the original, and even the game map is different. And this makes it feel odd and unfamiliar. The mechanics are all there, hold down the fire button to get missiles etc using transporters, and the enemies stop spawning when you get near to the right hand edge of the screen but it's still a flip screen scroll. For me, this is not as good as the original, and I much prefer the colourful fluid style of the Spectrum version. On to Head Over Heels then, released on the Spectrum in 1987 and on the Amiga in 1991. An absolute classic for the Spectrum, with Bernie Drummond graphics and great sound on the 128K machines. The Amiga version maintains the nice graphics, but again I feel the walls and floor are a bit dull in comparison. Controls work well, and the game plays in pretty much the same way. I was not very good at 3D games like this, but it plays well enough, and I can't help thinking it could have been made so much better. On to Jet Set Willy 2, released on the Spectrum in 1985 and on the Amiga in 1992. The Spectrum version was what you would expect, and I don't think I need to explain it. You move around, collecting items left over from a party, to allow you to get to bed. The Amiga version loses a lot of the original. The main sprite is fine, but the backgrounds do distract a little. The other game sprites look like they are animating too fast, and overall it's a bit of a letdown. The game I downloaded for the A500 let me complete it as there was no Maria guarding the bed, but the ADF version, which will work on emulators, is fine. The game also drops the room names, which added a bit of fun to the original. The Amiga version has scrolling instead of flip screen, but everything moves too slowly, and the game just plods along. The Spectrum version, in my opinion, was much better. Now onto a game that I'm not really should be included, but we'll give it a try. Cauldron on the Spectrum was released in 1985, and Super Cauldron on the Amiga was released in 1993. Now the Spectrum version was a success with different gameplay elements such as flying and platforms, the graphics were nice, and the game was well received. The Amiga version then... ...is a little bit different. The main sprite has been made cute, and I don't think that really suits the game. And I think they're trying to update it, but I don't think it looks right. The graphics and backgrounds are fantastic, but the game just doesn't feel like Cauldron anymore. You can fly around, drop rocks onto things, and move to different levels by going in and out of tree stumps, or underwater in some instances. I could see how this could be called a new version of the Spectrum game, but nah, cute graphics just don't do it for me. Let's move on to games that were released around the same time as each other then. Chubby Gristle was released in 1988 on both platforms. When I first loaded this up, that speech at the start brought back so many memories. Pick up back here. We all have to walk around saying, you can't park here all the time. Probably not funny now, but it was back then. The game on the Spectrum was tricky to play, a sort of mashed up Manic Miner cross with Monty Mole. The Amiga version is much the same, but obviously with improved graphics and sound. 
Again here, the joypad really hindered gameplay. Not a bad version, and I wonder which way round the games were done. Is this a Spectrum conversion of the Amiga, or the other way round? Now on to Daily Thompson's Olympic Challenge, again released in 1988 to coincide with the Olympic Games. The Spectrum version had some nice graphics. But the Amiga version really went to town with digitised animation and improvements all round. Playing this on the gamepad is almost impossible. On to Cybernoid, again released in 1988 on both platforms. I always found this a very tricky game to play, and the Amiga version is the same. Obviously, graphics and sound improvements to the classic, but I still feel the original was brighter and more defined. <laughs> On to Geo Blade then. Both versions released in 1987. The Spectrum had large, well-drawn sprites and nice backgrounds, but all in monochrome. The Amiga had smaller sprites, strangely enough, but obviously a lot more colour, and also a great machine gun sound. Sadly there's no scrolling here and it retains the Spectrum's flip screen action. Now the gamepad on the A500 is fine for some games, but it isn't good in all instances. To get the real Amiga feel, I bought a new Kempston Pro joystick, the USB version, and tried some games. I wanted to get that better accuracy and better diagonals. Sadly, it just didn't work. The A500, so it seems, is expecting a joypad with more buttons and a joystick that you used on the real thing. Which in one way is understandable, I suppose, but in another, a bit of a missed opportunity. I would suggest getting a better joypad if you're a serious gamer. Casual gamers, though, should be fine with the one that comes with the A500 if you just want a quick blast of the Chaos Engine. Spectrum games on the Amiga is a mixed bag, but overall I think the Spectrum games were more polished and had more love thrown at them. And the Amiga versions were just hastily thrown together to cash in on the name. A bit sad really, because the Amiga could have made some fantastic Spectrum versions of games. WC Le Mans was released into the arcade by Konami in 1986, and was one of the many that followed the classic pole position, improving every aspect and providing an exhilarating experience with fast visuals and great sound. It was a time trial format, giving the player a time limit to reach the next point. Converting this to the Spectrum was handled by Imagine Software in 1989, a brave attempt given the arcade's great look and sound. How would they get all of that detail and sound out of the humble spectrum? The title was released by Imagine Software in 1989, and after selecting your controls, the game begins, and obviously the voiceover from the arcade is missing, along with the colour. Now a quick word about the start. At first I tried to be careful, trying not to bump into the first four cars, but that ended badly. The best plan is to just accelerate as fast as you can, and don't move left or right, and your car will squeeze in between them, and then you can carry on playing the game. The car has two gears, high and low, and like pull position, you should always start in low before moving to high, when you hit a certain speed. The challenge is not to hit the other cars, or the side of the road, and to maintain as fast a speed as possible to reach those checkpoints. The graphics, as you can see, are monochrome, with split colours for land and sky, with the upper layer of clouds that remain static. The background trees scroll when you turn, 
and the track is well implemented, giving a good feeling of speed. Despite not being as fast and smooth as the arcade, you still get hills and valleys which feel really good as you power through them. You do have to use your brakes now and again for those tight corners and of course to make sure you don't go crashing into the other cars. The cars are drawn well enough but don't really convey that car feeling if that makes sense. The player car has a few frames of animation when turning left and right but again, not much else. Sound is used well though, with a decent engine sound, and the controls are tight, which is imperative for a driving game. Roadside objects scale pretty well, although you're far too busy trying not to crash to notice them. As you reach the checkpoint, you get a nice tune, and you continue on your journey with extra time. As the game progresses, the landscape or colours do not change, and it just becomes harder to complete the stage with less time and tighter corners. Converting the colourful, smooth arcade game to the spectrum was never going to be easy, but the game is pretty good to play. Once you get past that first bunch of cars, it then becomes fun, trying to squeeze past the other cars, going round corners as fast as you can, and all the time watching the timer count down. A good racer then, and definitely worth trying. This is Caesar the Cat, from Mirrorsoft, released in 1984. Now, you'd possibly look at the inlay and think this is an educational title, but you'd be wrong. You control Caesar the Cat on his never-ending mission to clear the larder of mice. There are four shelves stacked with food, and as soon as the game starts, the mice start arriving. Initially, black mice, and these are the slowest. Caesar has to pounce on them, and if he gets one, he's got to take it out of the door that randomly appears. To pounce on them, he has to jump on them from above or below, not sideways. Jumping on the shelves will also scare the mice off. So using this tactic, you can keep them away from the food while you get to the doorway or position yourself to grab a mouse. There are also things you can knock off the shelf and you have to learn which they are to avoid losing a life and the game. The game is also played against a timer, which ticks down at the bottom right. If this gets to zero, the game ends. To keep the timer high, you have to deliver a mouse through the door. There are three things that are on the next to the top shelf. There's one at either side and the blue thing in the middle. Now the collision detection with these is a bit off, so it's best to keep well away. As the mice continue eating, if you don't catch them, the food slowly vanishes, so you have to keep moving. Once you've caught 10 mice, which is indicated by the alarm clock on the bottom right, the food is replenished and the next wave of mice come in, the blue mice, and these are slightly faster than the black ones. If you catch another 10, you then move on to the red mice, the fastest. As you can see, the graphics are large and well drawn and really make good use of the spectrum with very little colour clash. That's mainly down to the well drawn sprites and of course the movement that avoids it. Sound is quite nice too, with some good tunes and effects. There is a hacked version that adds a Y sound, and this really does improve the game in my opinion. The gameplay is, well, okay I suppose. It's certainly challenging, and the idea is good. But going back to my opening comment, it actually feels like an educational title, despite being tricky to play. Maybe because of the bright colours and packed screen. One to try then, if you think you'll make a good mouse catcher. Let's take a look at some of the games released recently. First up is Ms Nampak from Jarlax. 
Did you see what they did there? Yes, this is a version of Miss Pac-Man. And what a brilliant version it is too. The graphics and sound are superb. And the game is very playable. The ghosts are well drawn and don't just chase you like so many other versions of the game. There are bonus items to collect as well and it's just one of those games that you want to keep going back and having another go on. Definitely one for Pac-Man fans or even Ms. Pac-Man fans. Next is Tiny Dungeons from Retro Souls. Anyone who likes dungeon crawlers should give this one a try. The game works really well and the music and graphics are good. You can open chests, break down doors, fight, use magic, read scrolls, get hints, and all this on the first few rooms. You can use magic for combat if you want and the controls are easy to use. You can also switch heroes, find keys and open passages. This game deserves a lot of playtime if you like this sort of thing. And finally, there's Rubino Cucaracha from Zosia Entertainment. Here we have a superb racing game with added elements of road rage. Your rivals use a variety of different weapons to stop you winning, so you have to avoid them using different tactics based on the weapon in use, and then when you get a chance use your turbo to get past them. You'll need to fill your turbo up first, and to do this, strangely, you have to bump into the other cars. There are different areas to race in with different scenery and the graphics and sound are fantastic. Definitely another one to grab. In the last episode I reviewed The Lords of Midnight by Drew Warger. At the end of that review I said that I'd started the next book Doom Dark's Revenge, and that, having read some of it, I could highly recommend it. Well, I've now finished the full book, and I don't think I could recommend this book more. Drew did a kickoff video for the launch of the book. In that kickoff video, he said that while he enjoyed writing The Lords of Midnight, the subject matter was a bit restrictive. In The Lords of Midnight, games don't differ that much. There are some random elements in there that mean that sometimes Doomstalk's armies go one way and sometimes Doomstalk's armies go another. But if you stick to one strategy, then the game will pan out pretty much the same. Whereas in Doomstalk's Revenge, every game is completely different. The AI is very random. For that reason, I'm actually not as big a fan of Doomstalk's Revenge as I am Lords of Midnight. Doomstalk's Revenge just seems too random. You can't really plan a strategy. You're almost constantly reacting to what happens. Drew said that that gave him a lot more leeway as an author, and that definitely comes through in this book. Another thing Drew said was that with Doomstalk's Revenge having so many, I think 128 different characters, he couldn't write every single one of them into the book, so he had to be selective with his characters. Choosing to concentrate on a small number, still a significant number, but a much smaller number than 120 years. The way he does this is absolutely masterful. Two of my favourite characters in the book are two of the dwarves, Imulon and Imilon. While it doesn't say so in the game, Drew makes these characters brothers. One, I'm guessing the older, is more steady, thoughtful, while the other one is much more impulsive. But they play a major part in Tarathel's quest in the book. Having said that, 
I think my favourite characters of all are the giants. When I played the game, I found the giants to be rather a nuisance. But when I read the book, I absolutely loved them. Drew paints their characters really, really well. As he does with all the characters he selected, he adds a load of depth to each character in the book. Another thing Drew said in that kickoff video was he used a table of each of the characters to help him define how they would be in the book. And then he points out some interesting things. While most of the Ice Lords are evil, there are good Ice Lords. And he uses that in the story, weaving it in so that some Ice Lords are actually willing to help and turn against Shoreth. Similarly, there are good and evil dwarves, and barbarians, and even fear. So as the threads of the book weave and play out, you find that there are stresses and conflicts within each of the races of Icemark. Some characters want to help. Some characters aren't so helpful. Some characters are cowardly. And this comes into play too. There is, of course, a final showdown between Luxor and Shoreth. And this plays out to an interesting conclusion. It wasn't what I expected. I'm really trying not to give away spoilers in this book, but I think I have to say that the role that Tarathel plays in the final showdown is excellent. I really like the character of Tarathel in the book. She portrayed really, really well, and it's how I imagined her, but still different. She has a certain steel to her that, from fans of the game, people who've read the novella will recognise, but so much more depth. One difficult thing about this book is actually to find a criticism. I don't think there was anything about it I didn't like. In fact, I couldn't put this book down when I picked it up. I just had to keep reading it at every opportunity. I spent the majority of a sunny weekend in my garden reading and reading until I'd pretty much finished. One thing I would say is if you want to read this book, I would recommend you do read The Lords of Midnight first. But even if you read that book and you weren't that keen on this, I would still say you should pick this one up. It is better, obviously for the reasons Drew said. He had a lot more leeway as an author and he used that and did a really good job. At the end of the book, there is a teaser for the next one, kind of an end of credit scene. And Drew has said he's going to go on and write the Book of the Citadel and then The Eye of the Moon. My only regret is I can't read them now. If those books are only as good as The Lords of Midnight, then they'll still be really good. If they're as good as this book, they'll be excellent. So that's Doom's Dark's Revenge by Drew Warger. Highly recommended. Until next time, happy reading. Happy reading.